we heard a loud bang, and I stopped and said, what was that? And the next thing I heard was everybody said, run, he's got a gun. Within about a millisecond after that second shot, most people knew it was gunfire and we needed to start scrambling, and that's exactly what we did. It seemed to be like return fire, pop, 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 pop. I bet you there were 30 to 50 shots that I heard. And I heard some of the players saying, you know, just, you know, just shoot him. He was like, you know, they shot one of his buddies and they were shooting at them and they were shooting all of us. Most people on both sides, Republican and Democrat, had the sense to condemn today's assassination attempt on Republican members of Congress for the atrocity that it was, of course. And yet, unfortunately, most people is not everybody. Several people on the hard left praised today's shootings as an act of self-defense or of revolution or of something. Many others balk at a literal shooting but have defended mock violence, beheadings of President Trump, or on-campus riots against conservative speakers. There seems to be a trend of rhetorical violence at any case, in any rate, and in some cases literal violence on the left. What's driving it? John Daniel Davidson is the senior correspondent for The Federalist. He's written on this, and he joins us tonight. So you see this as a trend then? Yeah, I think we've been seeing this coming for a while. You know, and as I wrote last month, it started for the most part on college campuses, uh, the kind of intolerant, violent protests that uh, sought to shut down conservative speakers and, uh, you know, Charles Murray and a professor that invited him to Middlebury got attacked, sent the woman to the hospital. Uh, so we've seen this on college campuses and as we know, most things that start on college campuses in America end up filtering out into, you know, the general public. What's the motive behind it exactly? Where does the anger come from, do you think? I think a lot of it comes from the fundamental difference between the way progressives view politics and the way conservatives view politics. For progressives, an issue like uh, health care or immigration or gun control isn't just a matter of a policy difference or a, right. a, a difference of opinion. It, it's an article of faith. And if you disagree with them about that, uh, you're not just uh, ill-informed or wrong. You're a bad person. You're a racist. You're a right. xenophobe. Uh, and, and you need to be silenced. You know, and this is the rhetoric that we see coming out of campuses, and increasingly we just see that in uh, public life in America. You're an apostate because to them, and, and the irony, of course, is that the left is basically secular, aggressively secular in a lot of cases, but they've just transferred that religious impulse to politics. So they mean it in a way that the right doesn't. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. And it's not necessarily a new thing. You know, you, you go back... Uh, you know, in 2009, when they were debating Obamacare, right. Ezra Klein, who's uh, you know otherwise a reasonable guy, yeah. said Joe Biden was willing to cause the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people because he wouldn't vote for an amendment on Obamacare. You know that kind of rhetoric, that way of thinking about policy disagreements, is is how you kind of talk yourself into neat feeling or needing to do something drastic to to change the political situation you can kind of see where this is going as you just wisely noted things that incubate on college campuses tend to kind of flower in the larger society where are the adults on college campuses I mean they they're bought into institutions you know they're drawing salaries they have 401ks don't they have an interest in keeping this stuff from exploding and wrecking our society well, you would think they would, but the adults on college campuses are the ones who have inculcated this into their students, uh, you know, through not just through the, what they teach in the classroom, but through how they respond. You see college administrator and college uh, president after president kind of cowing to the demands of these protesters, uh, you know, from Berkeley to Middlebury, and that encourages this behavior. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't tamp it down. There's never really a pushback. Was there re really ever any punishment for the students that no. sent that professor to the hospital in Middlebury? I didn't hear about it. No, that's right. In, in the end, they're afraid of the mob, too. And I think the congressional leadership on the Democratic side is starting to feel that way, too. John, I was hoping you were going to make me feel better. You made me feel more morose, but I think you're right. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me.